Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And we do have people from all over the world joining us for our third ICF webinar. This week, the topic is considerations for the female athlete. My name is Ross Solly. I am the uh, communications and media manager for the International Canoe Federation. And very, very uh, excited to have as our special guest this week, Claire Minahan from Australia. Uh, she's a sports scientist, a strength and conditioning coach. She's the associate professor at Griffith University in Queensland, uh, where she's led the Griffith Sports Science Group since 2002, uh, which would have made her about 10, I think, when she started. So uh, <laughs> uh, her overall brief is the advancement of human performance and with a particular focus on female athletes. And she's currently overseeing a major research project involving several leading Australian sporting teams and uh, has a lot of expertise in this field. Of course, um, if you have questions, Claire is happy to take them at the end. It is getting late in Australia, um, so but she is happy to stay on and, and take questions at the end. Please go to the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, click on that, and you can put your questions in there. Like questions if you like the look of some of the, the uh, questions that are already there and they'll work their way to the top. Uh, don't forget after this, uh, this will be posted online in a couple of days time so you can let your friends know about it if they've missed it. Uh, and also there'll be a questionnaire sent to you as well, which you can fill in just to give us some feedback on how the sessions are going, uh, any improvements you'd like to see, maybe even if there's topics you'd like to suggest for future webinars, we'd be really keen to take that on board. Anyway, enough from me. I'm going to hand over to Claire. Enjoy this presentation and um, we'll be back with you very, very shortly. Claire, over to you. Uh, G'day everyone. Thank you, Ross. Thanks for the introduction. Um, really, thank you for, for joining me. Um, it's about eight o'clock at night on the Gold Coast here in Queensland, Australia. Um, obviously, we've just started spring, so it's absolutely beautiful here on the Gold Coast. I, I really hope you're all well. Um, wherever you're coming in from and it's an absolute pleasure to to have you all all from around the world and um, I, I sincerely hope that um, you're all very well and for those athletes that are on board uh, I hope you're able to train hard um, and for the coaches you're able to manage um, your athletes well so I'm going to share my screen now and hope that you can all see that. Please let me know if you can't follow along. Um, so I've been given the brief to um, give you some information about what considerations there might be for female athletes and, and elite female athletes. Um, I know that most of you are interested in, um, but this is relevant for all female athletes. Um, now that's a huge, very broad topic, considerations for the female athlete. There are absolutely numerous, um, and as there are for male athletes. Um, I started my career about 20 years ago um, in terms of research and spent probably the first 10 years um, making gender comparisons. So what was the difference between the strength of men and women? What was the difference in the speed between men and women? Why were they different? And I kept coming up with the same findings. Men are stronger, men are faster, men are fitter, they're leaner. Um, and so I, I started to realise, and, and, and we do as sports scientists, we want to optimise performance in every athlete. And by continuing to compare women to men, um, I wasn't achieving that for the female athletes that I was working for. I kept comparing them to men. So over the last 10 years, I changed tact in terms of my research and started to look at unique physiology, female specific physiology that might affect the health, the well-being, and the performance of our elite female athletes. And so what I wanna focus on in this particular um, presentation today is one of the unique aspects of women. And that, of course, um, is, a, is a pretty obvious one. And that's the menstrual cycle. Um, and we know that that's um, unique to women and alongside the menstrual cycle is a whole heap of physiology that's unique to women. So what 
in, in the context of the menstrual cycle, what are the considerations for elite performance? And we look at sort of defense performance, team sport performance, individual performance um, in the sports, but also in the arts. Now, as I said, this information that I'm sharing today is absolutely relevant um, for canoe, kayak, useful information. Um, and you've got some really nice questions to ask. I can't cover everything, um, but I hope to cover enough that um, sparks some curiosity from your end. So let's, let's start with the basics. And some of you um, may absolutely be well aware of the basics and others may not. And so what I want to make sure is that we're all on the same playing field when we're talking about menstrual cycle. So the, the two um, female sex steroids that I'm interested in are estrogen and progesterone and they really drive the reproductive system and drive the menstrual cycle and they're absolutely yes involved in reproduction um, but they're also involved in a whole host of other biological systems um, in 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 the human body and in, and in women so when we talk about menstrual cycle it's this fluctuation of changes across about a month of the female sex steroids, estrogen and progesterone. Um, and as part of that menstrual cycle, women have a period, a menstrual period. And that literally is the release of the li internal lining of the uterus through the vagina. It can also be called menstruation and it can be called menses. For the most part in the English language, people call it a period. So if I take you now to the figure, um, the main points I want you to take away from this figure is the three phases of the menstrual cycle and what the hormone fluctuations generally are in those phases. You don't need to know concentrations. You don't need to know the exact ratios between the two uh, sex steroids, that is estrogen and progesterone. But what I want you to understand is the three phases of the menstrual cycle and how those phases might affect the health the well-being and the performance of elite female athletes. So let's take a look at the pink area. That's called the follicular phase. Now, the follicular phase can range in length or duration. And we've got duration along the x-axis, so the bottom of that figure there. Um, and that's menstrual cycle day. So from 0 to 28 days, that is one menstrual cycle. That can vary in length, but it's about 28 days. So the follicular phase is characterized by low levels of both estrogen and progesterone. So them having the least physiological effect on our female athletes, if you like. So follicular phase is um, characterized by low estrogen and progesterone. As we go through the follicular phase, we get this rise in estrogen. That is the blue line that you can see. And by about day 13 to 15, we have what we call ovulation. That is the release of, the, of an egg from the ovaries. And how this is characterized is a peak in estrogen, but remaining low levels of progesterone. And there's been some interesting data come out about this phase of the menstrual cycle in terms of injury. And we can get to that and perhaps have a bit of a discussion at the end about that. So we've got the follicular phase where there's low levels of estrogen and progesterone and the ovulation phase where there is high estrogen and low progesterone. And the third phase I want you to be interested in is the luteal phase. And that's characterized by both elevated concentrations of progesterone and estrogen. So there are three clear phases here. You might read in the textbook or on Google that there are five different phases, but for the purposes of this presentation, Think about the menstrual cycle in three distinct phases, follicular, ovulation, and luteal, with the varying levels of hormones. Now, if you think you have these varying levels of hormones or ver three very distinct um, profiles of hormones, what we want to know is does that affect the health, the well-being, and the performance of our athlete? So that menstrual cycle creates already three distinct hormonal profiles. And we call that or that menstrual cycle 
naturally cycling. That is, there is no dysfunction, there is no manipulation via synthetic hormones. It is a naturally cycling menstrual cycle. A female who is got regular periods um, is, is, is characterized as naturally cycling. There are various other hormonal profiles. The first being menarche, which is the um, first period that a female will have, and that would occur between about 11 and 14 years. Pregnancy, of course, um, um, suggests there is another hormonal profile whereby estrogen is, is very high, very, very high. Menopause, of course, is um, the cessation of the menstrual cycle um, occurring um, beyond the age of 45 in general. But the two other hormonal profiles that I want you to be interested in over the next few slides is menstrual dysfunction and hormonal contraception. So the three hormonal profiles are the naturally cycling menstrual cycle in the three phases, menstrual dysfunction, meaning if we don't get that menstrual cycle, a normal menstrual cycle, what might that do to health, well-being, and performance of an athlete? And then the manipulation of a menstrual cycle via hormonal contraception. What does taking synthetic hormones do to the health, well-being, and performance of female athletes? Before we can explore what menstrual dysfunction might do, um, we, we have to understand what a normal menstrual cycle is. And, and this is one of the basic things that I believe every coach, every support staff, and every athlete should be crystal clear on. A normal menstrual cycle looks like a first period occurring between the age 11 and 14 years. A cycle length or a menstrual cycle between 25 and 35 days. Now I showed you a menstrual cycle of about 28 days. A normal menstrual cycle occurs on a 25 to 35 day cycle. That is you're having a regular period every 25 to 35 days. A period duration of between four and seven days. So your period lasts between four and seven days. And this one's a little trickier, but the period flow or the menstrual flow is about 30 to 60 mils. So if you think about 30 to 60 mils of water, that would be a normal menstrual cycle. Now, any change from this normal menstrual cycle may in fact lead to an athlete needing or being required to see their general practitioner, their medical practitioner, because there may be an underlying problem or issue. Now that's the health of the athlete. We should be, and we need to be concerned about the health of the athlete first and foremost. But once we've covered off on the health of the athlete, can then we start asking questions about how the menstrual cycle affects performance? So thinking about a normal menstrual cycle, take the normal menstrual cycle, and now let's just have a look at some of the hormonal profiles that may occur if a female or female athlete has menstrual dysfunction. That is, they aren't experiencing a normal menstrual cycle. So the normal menstrual cycle can be affected uh, in several different ways. You can see here at the top, this is a four week cycle of a period lasting between four and seven days. There it is regularly occurring at the top there. This is a list of menstrual dysfunctions. Now, I don't expect any coach or even athlete to be able to pronounce these words. I don't, I don't believe you don't need to um, understand the ideology behind a lot of these dysfunctions. What I do think is important is that you understand some of the frequently occurring dysfunctions that can happen in female athletes. And we'll get to the prevalence and things in a minute. But amenorrhea, which is the second line there in this figure, is the complete absence of a menstrual cycle for three cycles in a row. It is the complete absence of a menstrual cycle or a menstrual period. 
the absence of a menstrual period three months in a row. Menorrhagia is a heavy menstrual period. So therefore, the flow is heavy, being described as heavy. That is, they're requiring to change a pad or a tampon more than every two hours. And these are really practical things to know. Um, or the period is lasting for much longer than eight days. And the third one that I want you to be aware of at least, probably because of the prevalence in, in athletes, is oligomenorrhea. And this is a sporadic uh, period that occurs greater than 35 days apart. So they occasionally get their period, but the, the duration between one period and the next is longer than 35 days. So we've got a normal menstrual cycle. We've got a complete absence of a menstrual cycle. We've got a very heavy menstrual cycle and one that's infrequent. They're the three um, that I think most coaches and athletes should be aware of. Now, what are the symptoms that can be associated with menstrual dysfunction? Of course, an abnormal menstrual cycle, that is no period, an infrequent period or a very heavy period. It can be associated with pain and cramping leading up to the period or during period. There are also some um, conditions related to excess facial hair, severe acne. And these are some of the signs and symptoms of menstrual dysfunction that may warrant an athlete visiting their medical practitioner. So I'm not gonna go over these potential conditions where, and I'm not a medical practitioner, but what I want you to understand is if the hypothalamus, the pituitary or the ovaries, that is our endocrine system essentially, where we produce hormones, that can be affected by a whole host of behavioral um, and disorders and diseases or illnesses. If any one of those um, glands are affected, that may be uh, reflected in an athlete's menstrual cycle. So it really is a window into the health of a, of a female athlete. The prevalence of menstrual disorders is higher in female athletes than sedentary individuals and can be up to 61% of athletes. And that's been reported in the literature. It does vary by discipline, and we see that menstrual dysfunction is higher in those aesthetic sports, diving, gymnastics, etc., but also endurance um, and weight class sports. It's less so in ball and team and power sports. However, it's still a significant number of female athletes being affected by menstrual dysfunction. So you have the three phases of the menstrual cycle, um, which may affect health, well-being, and performance. And we'll get to that and how. You have menstrual dysfunction, so the disruption to the menstrual cycle and a disruption to those naturally fluctuating hormones of estrogen and progesterone. And besides the obvious of cramping and bloating and generally feeling unwell, how might that affect health, well-being, and performance? And the third one I want you to have a think about is what if an athlete manipulates their menstrual cycle using hormonal contraception? So that is synthetic female sex hormones, synthetic estrogen and synthetic progesterone. By taking a hormonal contraception, that means that the endogenous estrogen and progesterone of a female is suppressed and we have um, much higher circulating levels of estrogen and progesterone, albeit um, uh, synthetic. So there are many types of hormonal contraception. Um, the most common is the combined pill. And here across the top, we have the type of hormonal contraception, the device, um, the method, the frequency, the brands that are typ typically associated with that type and the formulation that is, are we administering both estrogen and progesterone or just progesterone in a synthetic form? 
So the combined pill is, can be also termed um, the oral contraceptive pill, of course. It's self-administered, taken orally. Um, and at least here in Australia, there are greater than 30 brands available. Um, and the combined part means that we're administering both progesterone and estrogen. Now that can come in the form of monophasic, biphasic or triphasic. So that depends on um, the uh, concentration of both progesterone and estrogen over a single cycle. In a monophasic combined pill, the level of estrogen and progesterone is delivered at the same level. So there's not much change in the physiological concentrations of these steroids. So we're much better able to try to understand how hormonal contraception affects performance. The mini pill is progesterone only. Um, an implant is medically administered. Um, it's implanted under the skin of the upper arm um, and it um, gives the uh, benefit of only having to be uh, administered every three years as compared to daily like the oral contraceptive pills. Some of the brands available, Implanon, Nexplanon, there might be others in, in Europe and Africa and wherever else you're tuning in from. These are some Australian brands, um, but I'm sure they're, they're international as well. You might have heard the term IUD, um, which is short for interuterine device. Um, this is also medically administered. Um, it lasts for five years and it's progesterone only. Um, and this progesterone doesn't go into the circulation. It's just a local delivery of progesterone. And that's important um, because it then doesn't tend to affect other biological systems of the body. The injection, medically administered and the vaginal ring which is self-administered um, and there are some brands and formulations there for you to have a look at. So just recapping, we've got the phase of the naturally cycling menstrual cycle. We've got menstrual dysfunction that disrupts that normal menstrual cycle. And now we've got a synthetic manipulation of the menstrual cycle. So you can see how complex it is to try to understand just one area of physiology and how that might affect the health, well-being and performance of elite female athletes. In terms of hormonal contraception, we think that um, the, the prevalence is similar in athletes compared to the general population. And that is that about 80% of females uh, will at least try some form of hormonal contraception at one point during their reproductive years. At any one time, about 50% uh, of athletes are, or female athletes, are on hormonal contraception of some kind. And these percentages change, of course, across the world. These are Australian numbers, which aren't dissimilar to that in, in the UK um, and the United States but it would vary um, across, across the world in terms of the prevalence. But our elite athletes tend, uh, about half our elite athletes tend to use some form of hormonal contraception at any one time. And um, the, the most common form of hormonal contraception is that combined oral contraceptive pill. 68% um, of the athletes that are on hormonal contraception indeed take oral contraceptive pill. Now, I'd love to tell you why, um, and I suspect it is purely because that's what the medical practitioners are administering, um, perhaps because it easy, is easy to stop and start. Um, it could be the most economically viable in some countries, but we don't have a good idea of why one is more prevalent than the other. Some of the um, reasons why your athletes might be on oral contraception is, of course, because of birth control and, and contraception, and indeed it is um, the most likely reason, and we've done some research around this. Um, but we're finding more and more athletes are on hormonal contraception to be able to predict their period and manipulate their period for certain um, events and competitions. Um, interestingly, uh, I was in a, a seminar with some athletes or a workshop with some athletes and I asked them to tell me um, how many of them knew 
which day of their menstrual cycle they would be on um, during a gold medal match. And no one could tell me. So in terms of their ability to predict or their intention to predict, they weren't doing a very good job of that. But we are finding more and more athletes using hormonal contraception to predict um, when their period's gonna occur. Those with uh, menstrual dysfunction um, uh, and menorrhagia, which is the, the heavy period, hormonal contraception can um, reduce the heaviness of those periods. So that might be another reason. And it also helps to reduce some other symptoms like acne, cramping and bloating. And so you might find that medical practitioners administer some form of hormonal contraception to an athlete purely because of some of these um, menstrual symptoms, if you like. So this is the, the interesting bit, I guess the, the part that you, you wanted to hear mostly about. And, and that is this relationship between menstrual cycle and athlete outcome. And as I've mentioned several times already, when I talk about the menstrual cycle, um, I want to be sure we're thinking about the three phases of the menstrual cycle and how those three phases may distinctly affect athlete outcomes about menstrual dysfunction and how some of those um, hormonal profiles or disrupted hormonal profiles might affect athlete outcome and then how synthetic hormones might affect athlete outcome. And when we talk about athlete outcome, I've also mentioned this, we're talking about the health, the well-being, and of course the performance of our elite female athletes. And these are all intertwined into one large relationship. I don't think you can talk about performance per se if you're not considering health. And there are probably some indirect as well as direct relationships between the health of an athlete, of course, and their performance. So this is how I've chosen to um, depict the relationship between menstrual cycle and athlete performance, if you like. So if we take health um, in the first instance, how does the menstrual cycle, the phase, the dysfunction, the synthetic hormones affect athlete health? And we can mean general health um, and susceptibility to illness and injury. Um, th there is of course some interrelationship between menstrual cycle and cardiovascular health. But by far and away, the number one uh, relationship or um, researched area is how menstrual dysfunction um, and the administration of synthetic hormones at an early age may affect bone health. And so this is the one I really wanna talk about. If we have a look at the figure here, and I'm, I must apologize because the source of this figure has disappeared um, and so I'd be very happy to, to post it somewhere if I need to. You've got the age in years across uh, the bottom and bone mass um, in on the y-axis up the left-hand side. And if we just concentrate on the women for the, for the first part, you can see that with increasing age from birth at age zero, right through to age 20, we have this rapid increase in bone mass. If everything's going well, if we're getting enough exercise, if we're getting enough calcium, if we're getting enough um, estrogen. And women don't reach peak bone mass until about age 23 or 24. So if everything's going well, women will reach peak bone mass at that age. Now you can see the line at the bottom shows what happens when there are suboptimal lifestyle factors that affect bone mass. Now this has both an acute and chronic outcomes for the athlete. What we mean by suboptimal lifestyle factors, there, there are various, but there are some very much related to menstrual cycle. To reach peak bone mass, women need to have circulating estrogen. And you might recall that one of those menstrual dysfunctions that I described was amenorrhea. That is the absolute absence of a period. 
And that occurs because the levels of circulating estrogen aren't high enough. Estrogen is absolutely suppressed in that case. So what that means is the absence of a period because of a reduced level of estrogen and a suboptimal um, ability for female athletes to reach peak bone mass. Now, as I said, that has acute consequences and may result um, in an increase in the risk of stress fractions. Um, and you'd be very well aware of some of those in, in, in endurance sports. In canoe kayak, it may be um, stress fractures of the ribs, um, but it could occur anywhere. Um, and in terms of a chronic or a long-term health issue, it may result in osteoporosis. As you can see, if peak bone mass isn't reached, then the chance of um, experiencing osteoporosis in later years um, is much higher. So again, if an athlete has amenorrhea, it may have consequences for their acute health and increase their risk of stress fracture. It may have consequences for their long-term chronic health and may increase their risk of developing osteoporosis in later years. So again, it is an incredible window into the health of our athletes. Wellbeing is an interesting topic um, and it can mean a whole heap of different things. And I think with wellbeing, you could um, probably pigeonhole some of the things back into health or up into performance. But there is this um, aspect of athlete outcome um, that is wellbeing. So how does the phase dysfunction and synthetic hormones affect well-being? Well, I've chosen here to just pick out three um, topics of well-being, that is sleep, mood and fatigue. Um, and you may have heard the term premenstrual syndrome, premenstrual stress, um, and really um, refers to anything that affects function um, as a result of menstrual cycle symptoms. And so we think that the phase of the menstrual cycle might affect the well-being of an athlete, depending on um, how they're psychologically affected by PMS, how they're physiologically affected by cramping, bloating, those kinds of things. So it may absolutely affect their mood. Premenstrual syndrome tends to occur right before uh, a female has their period. Um, so right at the back end of the luteal phase or the end of the menstrual cycle. Um, and there may be symptoms of fatigue and headaches and, and absolute symptoms that may affect performance as well um, as just general well-being. But, but a real relationship that we have examined and one that's in the literature here, if you can have a look at this figure, is how... Um, some of these aspects of the menstrual cycle and this one particularly is looking at synthetic hormones or oral contraception and how it affects sleep. I don't have to tell you how important sleep is to the recovery of athletes. Um, there is some really good information out there. Um, we know that sleep is important for um, not only brain function but um, restoration of bone and muscle and this particular paper found that women taking oral contraception, so the placebo means that they're in that week of inactive pill, um, or a group of girls or a group of women that were taking a pill that didn't have synthetic estrogen or, or um, progesterone in it. But that active, that black bar there shows females taking the oral contraceptive pill. And here it says that they um, have a greater percentage of their sleep time, that is the seven hours after they fall asleep, in stage two. Now that might say to you, fantastic, they're having more sleep. Well, that's not the case. There are five stages of sleep. The first stage is the lightest stage. The second stage uh, is slightly deeper. But as sleep stages increase, stage three and four is really where um, the restoration of bone 
and muscle starts to occur. Hormones get released in stage three and four sleep. Um, it helps um, aid in um, muscle growth, in bone growth. Um, and in fact, as humans get older, they tend to spend a lot less um, sleep in stage th um, three and four. So this is really representing some kind of effect on sleep in females who take hormonal contraception. I've chosen to put this um, up here because we're now moving into how menstrual cycle might affect performance. And when I talk about performance, there are so many aspects of performance, not just health and well-being, but I mean, does it literally improve the ability to race faster in an event? So that would be ability. Does it improve adaptation to training? depending on what phase we're in, depending if we take hormonal contraception or not. Are we able to adapt if we have menstrual dysfunction? And then of course there's recovery. There's been a lot of literature and media hype around menstrual cycle um, and how it affects performance. And there are, um, th there's quite a lot of touch points um, online and in webinars suggesting um, that you can train at certain times of your period or train at a certain phase and it will change performance or you might be stronger during a certain phase or you might um, have more endurance. I think we're not quite at that point yet where we can make general generalized statements about performance and so anytime you read that I suggest you're um, cautious and I suggest that you look at the references where those statements have come from. And I'll show you in the next slide what I mean. Where the research is at at the moment is probably at this primary physiology stage. So what are the acute responses and training adaptations at different phases of the menstrual cycle and whether or not someone's on contraception, uh, hormonal contraception or not? So there's been some excellent research examining if oral contraception affects aerobic metabolism, so VO2 peak or um, muscle efficiency or anaerobic threshold. In fact, some of the early work shows if women are taking a hormonal contraception, there's up to a 10% decrease in VO2 peak. And these are longitudinal studies, so very robust research studies. There's been some information in anaerobic metabolism and also force production. So neural excitation and activation and, and rate of um, force development. I call that primary physiology. There are certainly some mechanisms tying the hormones estrogen and progesterone to primary physiology. We know that if you're on hormonal contraception, your core body temperature is almost half a degree higher than if you're not on hormonal contraception. So that absolutely affects your thermoregulation. The question is, can we skip from primary physiology right up to performance? Can we say that because your VO2 peak is just decreased, your marathon time will also be decreased. Can we say that if your thermoregulation is more challenged, your 1500 meter swimming time will also be decreased? Unfortunately, there's very little evidence. And there was a review in the British Journal of Sports Medicine in the last uh, previous few months, absolutely indicating that there is no um, generalized evidence suggesting that either the phase of the menstrual cycle or hormonal contraception affects performance. There's absolutely the mechanisms to tie sex steroid hormones to physiology, but we don't have the evidence to suggest it affects performance. And we do feel like it's incredibly individualized at this, this point in time. So what do we do now? What do we do now? We have to start with health and well-being, and we've got to get to performance quite quickly. 
The Australian Institute of Sport have set up a female performance project, um, particularly in the area of menstrual cycle, just in its first year at the moment, in its first stages, and it's, um, it's got uh, these four pillars um, that it's examining. It's surrounded by, or, or the four pillars are a network of specialist practitioners, the education of athletes, coaches, and support staff, um, the, the monitoring, the athlete management system monitoring, and um, as much research um, as, as we can possibly do to try to answer some of these questions up at the performance end of things. So we're looking at these four pillars to try to answer some of these questions that I know you guys will have. The purpose of a medical network um, or, a, or triple SM we call it, sports science, sports medicine network, will help to open the conversation about menstrual cycle. We'll shut down some of those barriers between effective conversations between athletes and coaches and try to lead a strategy in terms of um, how do we get athletes to recognise that they might have menstrual dysfunction? How do we get athletes to recognise that oestrogen um, is incredibly important and the menstrual cycle can act like a window into their own health? How do we educate our athletes? What's the best way to educate your athletes? Do we look at providing um, infographics and workshops from an organisational point of view. I know Swimming Australia has started to create um, some infographics and they've got a specialist female athlete um, portal where athletes can go and access that information and so can the coaches and the support staff. Why is it so important to educate our athletes? We did a study um, just recently and found that just on basic questions like what are the two female sex steroid hormones less than 20 percent of athletes this is elite female athletes knew what female sex steroids were less than 20 percent of athletes identified what amenorrhea was so even if they were missing their period or had no period they couldn't identify what amenorrhea meant so um, we've got some real deep issues in terms of understanding what a normal menstrual cycle is and actioning uh, that if one there's dysfunction there or two there's some requirement to go on hormonal contraception the most important thing the most important information that i think i can feed back to you um, right at this point is absolutely have your athletes monitor their menstrual cycle we need to establish if your athletes have a normal menstrual cycle and how they might be affected by their menstrual cycle. Once a normal menstrual cycle is established, then we can start to think about how the phases of the menstrual cycle affect the health, well-being, and performance of each individual athlete. I think that's about 40 minutes. That was my uh, given time, I believe. So I'm going to stop there and I really look forward to answering some of your questions or even, even having a discussion. Uh, I, hope, I hope you enjoyed that. Yeah, that was uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. Very detailed um, and a lot of very important information in there. And I think our um, participants would have all picked up some very valuable information there for sure. Um, so can I just remind everyone, if they have questions, please uh, don't put them in the chat line. I, I can see some people are already doing that. Um, please put them in the Q&A tab. That is the best place to put them and that way everyone can see the questions and also that gives you the option to like questions if you see them. Um, and that way you can also um, put in your own question as well as, as liking other questions. So Claire, I don't know whether you can click, if you see the q and A. I do. tab at the bottom of your page, then you can also yeah. see the questions as well. Um, Fantastic. Um, I'll read them out as best I can. And uh, then if they make no sense to, to me, I'm sure they will to you. Um, so our first question is from Nicholas. 
Uh, Nicholas says, you mentioned that the lack of a period is quite bad specifically for increasing bone strength and mass, and that this peaks at around 25 years old. Does this mean that education during the early years in the pathway is more crucial than, sorry, I've just lost it, is more crucial than athlete education at the senior level uh, due to that they would more than likely be at the peak bone mass? That's an excellent question, and uh, I, I tend to agree with that, Nicholas. The, it's, it's, it's a sensitive topic. We definitely need to normalise these conversations, and the earlier we can do that, I think the better off athletes are going to be. Um, you know, reaching athletes at around 15 years of age, um, I think, is a good time to start introducing some of these topics. I think we need to bring parents along um, for the ride and we need to identify, I think this is crucial, whose responsibility is it to transfer this knowledge and deliver this message? Do we expect the coaches to have this knowledge or do we just expect the coaches to understand what a normal menstrual cycle is and, um, and direct their athletes to seek help if required? I think, um, yeah, the premise of your question is to start early, um, and, and I completely agree with that. We need to establish a normal, healthy menstrual cycle in our young female athletes. Uh, a lot of people, Claire, are asking this question from Alessandra. When is the optimal time to train strength, endurance, and speed during the menstrual cycle? Um, I, I, I would be in Hawaii if I knew that uh, answer. However, there's been some recent literature, um, in particular three research papers that are starting to show a trend towards um, the benefits of strength training in the follicular phase of the menstrual cycle. Now, that's not to say you don't train in the luteal phase. That's to say that a lot of periodized programs uh, might train hard for three weeks and then have a recovery week in the fourth week. That fits beautifully with a menstrual cycle. And what these papers are suggesting is that the intense weeks or the training weeks should absolutely be put in the follicular phase. And if you are going to have a recovery week, put it in the luteal phase. Because if you do most of your training in the follicular phase, you may indeed get greater cross-sectional area of muscle growth. Um, and, and certainly they're showing increases in muscle force. So there is some um, collection of information that may lead to that. There isn't the same information for endurance and speed, unfortunately. But you must realise that only about 25% of athletes have a normal menstrual cycle of about 28 days that occurs regularly. So if you have a squad everyone's going to have a different menstrual cycle. So you have to manage that so individually. And that's why I always come back to, are your athletes compliant and consistent with their monitoring so that you really have a very clear view of their menstrual cycle? I think this next question follows on from that. How would you structure training peaks around the menstruation? Yeah, so again, um, having those two high volume or high load uh, weeks in the in the first half of your menstrual cycle in the follicular phase um, and the evidence is there for strength training it isn't there for any other type of training um, the the danger we run into is that we uh, we assume what phase our athletes are in because we don't have compliance with our monitoring so we absolutely have to get that we need to establish normal menstrual cycle in our female athletes. We need to establish um, what phase of the menstrual cycle they're in. And if we can do those things, then putting strength training in the front half um, or, or the, or the uh, high load weeks of strength training, at least, with the recovery week being in the luteal phase. Um, Ivan has asked the question, can you combat the effects of amenorrhea on bone density with diet and weight-bearing exercise? Um, you, can't, you can't completely reverse it. It's, it's a really good question. And I think being canoe kayak as well and may also elevate the risk of poor bone health because there's no weight-bearing exercise. So that's the first thing. 
Um, there is some evidence to suggest you can increase bone strength in the later years, around 60 and 70, with very heavy resistance exercise. There's some good information coming out about that. Um, but certainly estrogen plays an absolutely crucial role in laying down um, the foundation and that, that bone mass in the early years. And if we don't get to a peak bone mass um, by age 24, we're never going to be able to make that up. Okay, uh, Alexandra asks, what type of diet is most recommended in the different phases of the menstrual, menstrual, menstrual cycle? Um, I'll probably um, refer you to some literature there. There's um, a little bit of information around, um, uh, you know, fat oxidation higher in different phases of the menstrual cycle when estrogen is high and th those kinds of things. It's a really complex question um, and probably one that requires either another webinar or, um, you know, um, some um, delving into the into the literature a bit more, um, so I'm happy to to, to report some um, perhaps review papers or, or where you might go to have a look at that information. Okay, really important question here from Margie Bone. We're seeing more and more women staying in the sport and training hard as they get older, especially in disciplines with competitive masters competition mm. at national level, such as canoe marathon. Mm -hmm. There's some evidence that these women are vulnerable to enhanced bone density loss if they train hard through and beyond menopause. Is there any medical evidence to support this? And if so, what sort of increased calcium intake is needed to protect, it, to protect active women from bone density loss through and beyond menopause? Is HRT the only option for competitive older women? Okay, so menopause is synonymous with bone loss. And the reason for that is because of a decrease in estrogen concentration. And there's nothing we can do about that except for hormone replacement therapy. And that is absolutely an option for some women. And there is absolutely strong evidence that it protects bone health. But there are certainly other considerations that need to be discussed between each individual and their medical practitioner. Um, by exercising more, that won't necessarily increase um, bone loss um, and unfortunately uh, no amount of calcium or ex you know excessive amounts of calcium will never make up for that bone loss either so again it's about having peak bone health at in your mid-20s and protecting that bone health by having um, circulating concentrations of estrogen throughout your reproductive years um, Estrogen is one thing. Weight-bearing exercise is a second thing. Um, not smoking. There is a whole raft of sort of behavioural um, conditions that we that we need to um, to abide by to protect our bone health. But going into menopause, there's not much you can do. Um, there's certainly a decline in bone health, regardless. Um, and HRT is absolutely a viable option for some people. A question from Haley Joe from South Africa. Uh, in your experience, which could be the best recommended option for contraception? Um, perhaps one of the progester progesterone only options, for example, Marina or IUD, given we need to expect that many athletes will need contraception for birth control, or is this all too individually specific? Thanks, Haley Joe. Um, yeah, again, I can't give that. It is incredibly individual, but I can say um, the Myrena is definitely becoming more popular in the uh, among elite female athletes. Probably one of a couple of reasons for that would be its convenience. Um, so it it's inserted. Uh, it doesn't need to be revisited for th th three years. Absolutely covers off on birth control. It's local progesterone delivery, so it doesn't tend to affect endogenous or naturally occurring estrogen and progesterone, um, so that, you know, it protects that ability to um, increase bone mass in the early years. 
Um, so yeah, if I had to say uh, anything about that, I would say that uh, we see more and more elite female athletes going down the Mirena um, IUD option, absolutely. Um, but I've, there, I've read reports that about one third of individuals that go down that path can have a few problems in the first few months and, and athletes in particular are put off it and have it removed quite quickly. So definitely requires um, uh, thorough discussions with general practitioners, medical practitioners, sports doctors. Uh, from Esther, have any studies been done or thought about looking at differences between long-term use of hormonal contraceptives compared to one-off use for competitions? Um, I'm not aware of any. Most studies that examine the effect of hormonal contraception um, have individuals on hormonal contraception for at least a year. Some have had them on, particularly the longitudinal studies, only for three months. Um, it does take, it, it doesn't take very long to, for the synthetic hormones to suppress endogenous hormones, um, but it may take a couple of months um, to be able to manipulate the menstrual cycle for competition. It's, um, you know, I'd be really interested to hear from, you know, coaches and athletes whether that has, or, or whether that's, you know, prevalent in elite sport. Um, I know athletes do manipulate their menstrual cycle. I'm just not sure if it's in an acute phase or, or uh, sort of chronically over, over the year, whether they do that. It's a really good question. Here's one that I'm sure many of our participants will be keen to hear your answer from Christina. What would you recommend to male coaches? Uh, what would you recommend to male coaches when approaching their female athletes about their menstrual cycles? Yeah, I think, look, Christina, I know certainly in Australia, it, it's certainly a thing. And we're, we're currently looking at what the barriers to effective conversations are. And I think establishing responsibility. Whose responsibility is it to have these, these conversations? Male coaches may or may not feel comfortable with this conversation. And, and the way I liken it to is, would you feel comfortable talking about gut and bowel issues with your coach? And if the answer's, well, not really, then I don't see why um, you might be comfortable about menstrual cycle. I think a coach needs to be aware of what's normal, know what some symptoms are um, that might alert them to the fact that something's not right or there is some dysfunction there. Um, and I, not being a medical practitioner, I would always refer to the medical practitioner. If there's a dietitian available, um, that's all, always an option as well. I don't think coaches need to be experts, but they need to be able to recognise when the health of their athlete is at risk because they're interested in performance and certainly the health of an athlete is going to affect performance. So I think male coaches should be able to recognise um, menstrual dysfunction through just general symptoms like bloating and cramping and um, general feeling of fatigue and unwellness. Um, they should be um, encouraging all their athletes to monitor their menstrual cycle um, at the very least. And I think over time, it'll become much more normal for coaches and athletes to be monitoring menstrual cycle like they do mood and fatigue and soreness anyway. Um, so we've just got to make it more normal over time, but I don't think the coach needs to be an expert. No, I, I suppose recognising is one thing, Claire. Starting that discussion is another, um, another area which, which some may feel tentative about. They may not know how to start that conversation. Does the female athlete, for example, volunteer information to the coach if they're, if they're feeling that you know, it might be affecting their training? Yeah, I would certainly encourage that. And, um, you know, the view might be that if they had a, an injury or, you know, a torn muscle, they're going to volunteer that information. I don't really see it as anything different. Um, but there is some social stigma, you know, stigma to it. And, and so we have to change that both in a sort of community level um, as well as with our elite athletes. It's a very difficult one to, to answer, but I think things are definitely changing. Mm. I think to separate that very close discussion and awkwardness, one way to do that is, is via the monitoring um, and whether that be an athlete management system or on an application, it's kind of 
you know, takes the, the coach one step away and then athletes are far more likely um, to volunteer that information. I think you've also answered Nikku's question there as well. Uh, David says, beyond the direct health impacts of dysfunction in menstrual cycle, are there times within the cycle when athletes are at a higher injury risk? If so, when and what times, types of injury risk? Yeah, there's, there's been some media attention around this um, of late. Um, and I'm aware of two um, papers uh, that have done research um, at a higher high enough level of quality to warrant talking about. Um, but again, we're sort of at that mechanistic level. There's been no prospective studies um, where an athlete has an injury and we're on the sideline to measure um, their hormones to determine exactly which phase of the menstrual cycle they're in. So we don't know, but via mechanisms, we're making some assumptions and that tends to be in the ovulation phase. So if you remember from one of the first slides, ovulation is where estrogen is very high and progesterone is low. Now, two things mechanistically might be occurring here to increase injury risk. The first one um, is that uh, increasing um, levels of circulating estrogen increases joint laxity. So we've got a lot more movement in our joints, our ligaments, a little bit more lax. And we know this from pregnant women um, who have sky high estrogen and they're able to deliver babies because they're a little more lax um, in their ligaments throughout their pelvic region. The second thing is there's some information coming out now showing that estrogen might be related to forced production. So increased estrogen, potentially increased forced production you put together increased force production and decreased or increased joint laxity, you may have a situation where during ovulation, there is an increased risk of um, ligament injury. So again, it's that making the translation between mechanisms and physiology through to performance. Until we get those prospective studies, um, we're not going to be able to make uh, any definitive conclusions about menstrual cycle phase and injury. All right, now it's getting late in the evening in Australia, so we need to let Claire get off uh, very, very soon. We may have time for maybe two more questions, Claire. Um, a couple of people have asked uh, if it's possible for you to provide some links to your research uh, so that they can use it to become better informed and also to share it with their coaches, et cetera. So we'll chase that up with you, Claire. Oh, um, I'd be pleased to. Yep. What is, what is the role of testosterone in women? That's a, that's a um, long answer. Um, and there certainly is testosterone in, in women and plays um, a role j just as it does with men in terms of um, signaling in all different types of cells, including muscle cells, and ligament cells and bone cells. Um, it, the, the fact is that the concentration of testosterone in women is um, so much smaller than men. Um, and so we don't have the benefit of testosterone when it comes to force production and muscle growth and things like that. It does vary in women, testosterone concentration, and it can vary a lot. Um, one of the um, Dysfun or one of the dysfunctions associated, menstrual dysfunctions associated with increased testosterone is polycystic ovary syndrome, um, which happens to be a lot more prevalent in female athletes as compared to the normal population. And so that manifests with um, hair growth and acne. And one thing that happens is um, females don't particularly like the, this hair growth and acne and, and generally um, very heavy periods. And so they go to their medical practitioner and their medical practitioner puts them on a, a combined oral contraceptive pill. There's a couple of problems with that. One, it usually happens when they're young um, and it may affect their ability to reach peak bone mass. Two, it fiddles around with their testosterone concentration. So it's actually changing their physiology a little bit. What you do have to remember is um, the difference between a female without elevated testosterone is here and slightly elevated testosterone is there. And then we've got ma male concentrations of testosterone that is way up here. So there's a huge variation. 
but um, it, it's, it has the same um, function as, as it does in men. It's just at a lot smaller concentrations. All right, final two questions. Um, what do we look out for in the use of platforms like Garmin Connect that you mentioned for tracking and monitoring menstrual cycles? Um, it will depend on what level of athletes you're dealing with. Um, I would suggest, you know, your national athletes would have their organisational athlete management system, custom made perhaps, um, but there are a, a range of commercial applications that you can use to track menstrual cycle. Um, and then there's the old fashioned way, which is to get a paper diary and, and write in that paper diary. Um, most people choose an application. Um, a lot of them are good. Um, and, and I've chosen the Garmin one there because I like the pretty colors and I find it very easy um, for athletes just to click on what their symptoms are. One thing I would caution you to is the information uh, or some of the information that these applications provide that aren't necessarily based on robust research. And so you definitely need to warn your athletes um, to not pay attention to that information in particular. But really what you just want them to do is use the calendar to track their menstrual cycle and their associated symptoms. All right, and let's finish with the $63 million question. Uh, you touched on this already in your presentation, but Katharina says, when is the best time to participate in a competition in the menstrual cycle? I guess there's no bad time to compete. That's, that's the first point to make. And world champions have been made at every day during the menstrual cycle. Um, so there's no bad day. Um, an athlete will find their non-preferred days by tracking their menstrual cycle. And that will, be, that will have associated um, symptoms. Um, and it may be to the point where if you know your athlete for long enough, you'll be able to see that they do start to perform better in certain perhaps phases or weeks of their menstrual cycle. Um, we're conducting some research at the moment and it appears as though athletes prefer the second week of their menstrual cycle. That is their period with very low levels of progesterone and estrogen. And in the second week, you start to get this increase in estrogen with um, low levels of progesterone. Now that's absolutely subjective. Um, uh, and there's no um, robust research around, around that. But um, I, I do trust athletes' intuition, and I think there could be something there. The second week tends to be where athletes prefer, um, but we've got to do a lot of research to find out if that's physiologically the case and whether it relates to performance. Thank you, Claire. Fantastic presentation. You've been very generous with your time. Uh, thank you to everybody. Some wonderful questions today. It really shows that uh, they were taking it in and lots of good feedback too. Claire, lots of people saying that they learnt a lot today from listening to this. So that's good. That's what these webinars are designed to do. So uh, we thank everybody who took part. Um, as I said, uh, we will post this online in a, in a couple of days' time, so you can go back and please do recommend it to your friends that you think might find this subject interesting. Um, we'll also send out a questionnaire for people to give their feedback and uh, to give suggestions on how to uh, do these presentations into the future. Our very next presentation is a week from today. It's on energy and expenditure and fatigue. So again, um, a lot of uh, interesting topics there that will be discussed. Claire, thank you so much. We're going to let you go off now and have your supper or go for a run or whatever you do at <laughs> nine o'clock at night on the Gold Coast. Um, but thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk to us today. It has been really, really informative. We've enjoyed it a lot. Thank you everyone else for uh, participating and uh, hopefully we'll see you all in a week's time. Thank you, Claire. Any final thoughts? I should throw to you for any final thoughts before we go. No, no, no uh, final thoughts. I think, um, you know, trying to optimise every individual um, is the key. And, it, and if that means using all the tools you have in your toolkit and menstrual cycle is one of them, then you should absolutely use it. Great stuff. Thank you, Claire. Best of luck. Cheers, my pleasure. Research, and uh, we'll speak to you again soon. Thank you, everyone. See you in a week's time.